Good morning. Uh, for anyone who may not know me, I'm Helen Davenport, a partner in the commercial litigation team at Gowan and WLG, and the head of cybersecurity and data privacy for the UK firm. Thank you very much for joining our latest IT Masterclass by webinar this morning. I hope that you're well, uh, you're managing with the lockdown, and that your families are all well too. The topics that we've selected to cover today are highly relevant in the context of COVID-19, but have a broader application too. We will hear from my colleague, Rocio de la Cruz on online trading and data privacy risks. My colleague, Alex Kim, will speak on direct marketing, and I will cover cybersecurity. A couple of pieces of housekeeping. We will aim to speak for around uh, 40 minutes and then answer as many questions as we can in the remaining time. If you would like to answer a question, sorry, ask a question during the seminar, you can do so by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and submitting your question. We will treat all questions anonymously. This session is being recorded and will be available on demand, so if you have any connection or other issues, then not to worry as we'll receive a further copy following the webinar. I will now hand over to Rocio to talk to us about online training. Thank you, Helen. Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome, and I'm very happy to, to be here with you this morning. And in this part of the, um, the session, my colleague Alex and I will cover three areas that we've seen that from clients we are advising on, in particular in during this COVID-19 situation, um, have been more affected, if you like, on online businesses. And these areas are terms and conditions, the use of cookies and the information provided concerning cookies and marketing. In any case, um, the main thing to, to bear in mind, as, um, as I will show in the next slide, is that when you are um, offering online services and, and you are uh, showing your website. So if I can move on, on to my next slide, you will see that this is um, what I call the accountability window. And I think this is the main thing, the main thing to bear in mind. Um, what's on your website is what the public see. So when you are offering goods and services online, your website is what I call this accountability window only because the way you have drafted your privacy notice, your consent forms, your cookies policies, and your terms and conditions reflect your level of compliance to some extent. So if you go on the web website and you see a company with a poor privacy notice, this is telling the public that this company didn't take very seriously compliance with GDPR. And the reason why I call it window as well is because this is what regulators look at first. Even before contacting you, uh, if they are investigating a company as a result of a complaint, they will probably go on the website and have a look first. So let's talk about the impact on the precise documents that we are seeing that due to COVID-19 are subject to more changes. The first thing we are asking to clients is what are you doing differently now? And how this affects customers, and in particular if these customers are consumers. And this is because what you do differently is what needs now to be told in a very specific way and very clearly. And this is relevant because it will ensure compliance with the Consumer Contracts Regulations 2013 for those of you um, to which the CCRs apply. And also, of course, it, it ensures compliance with the GDPR, the Data Protection Act 2018, and PERC, the Privacy and Electronic Communication Regulations. And in practice, uh, this affects things like, for example, changes on the delivery times if you are delivering goods, uh, changes on the delivery methods as well, and this uh, may imply that you need to revise your terms and conditions. You may need to contract new service providers, for example, if you are seeing um, an increase of um, 
um, purchases made online and you need to employ more people uh, on the warehouses, for example, um, while you are still uh, complying with the social distances and the other rules. And perhaps you need further support and that, again, uh, will um, mean a change on the, on the terms and conditions as well and what you need to communicate uh, to your customers. Some of these service providers might also be data processors, so that means as well additional documentation in terms of the arrangements that you have with your processors, privacy notice, and again, terms and conditions. You may also consider, for example, collect additional data if you are rethinking or restructuring uh, the, the way you are going to market and target individuals. Um, so you may collect now more data or you may collect less data. For example, if in, until now you were asking for signatures uh, when you were delivering something and now you will not request the customer signature. So again, that will have an impact on, on the privacy notice. And also if you collect additional data, you may need consent uh, for, for, to, to be, uh, for the processing of this data to be lawful. Um, finally, you also may consider use additional tracking tools and cookies. For example, if you were using cookies for analytic purposes only um, in order for your website to, to, to provide a better experience to the customer, and now you are thinking on, on placing additional cookies for retargeting purposes, for example. So once you identify the changes that apply to you, to what you are um, the way your business is going to be uh, developed from now on during this situation, then you need to consider how and when to provide this information. So something that I think most of us know is that the terms and conditions always need to be available on the website. So there always needs to be a link visible uh, to these terms and conditions. But in addition, that is specific information that needs to be highlighted at, a, at the appropriate time. And this is the time for those of you dealing with consumers, um, the time in which uh, it is stated in the CCR. So you will see that I have included two slides with tables in which I have um, um, included some of these relevant bits of information um, under a consumer perspective. Uh, these are the bits of information that, after speaking with some clients, uh, we noted that are most likely to be impacted by the COVID-19 changes. Uh, and then I've included a column on what is mandatory, another column on what is recommended by the European Commission. Um, I have uh, no time to go through each of the changes, but um, I, I thought that you may find this table useful. Um, and please feel free to write any questions as you are reading through it, or if you need more time to consider uh, this, um, the information that I provide in this table and you want to drop me a line afterwards, I will be very happy to, to talk to you through them if you want to. Moving on to the cookies. So um, whether or not you um, are considering using additional cookies now for your business, it's always a, a good time to review what you've got and the information that you provide and the way you are collecting consent. So as you know, the cookies are regulated under the Privacy and Electronic Communication Regulations, PERC, which needs to be interpreted along with the GDPR and the Data Protection Act. So it is very important the information that you provide to customers and also the consent forms that you are using. And it's important that you re 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 review them and you update them. So when updating cookies documents, you need to consider the revised guidance that was, was published by the ICO in July last year. Uh, and this has been published in line with some res resolutions by the European Court of Justice as well, in which certain points were clarified. And the, the key points are that most of the cookies need consent, except if it is a communication cookie or if it is a strictly necessary cookie, and then 
the interpretation of a strictly necessary is very narrow. So it's only the cookie that you need for the, the website to work or the app to work um, in terms of functionality. No preferences, no better experience to the user. All of those cookies or tracking tools are not considered necessary, even if it is for the benefit of the user of code that the, the user will appreciate it. You may still, you will still need consent for those ones. The consent uh, needs to comply with the GDPR requirements, even if it is for anonymized cookies. And so, for those using anonymized analytics cookies, you will need consent. Um, and also, the information that you need to provide um, needs to be detailed, including the the length of time for which you are using persistent cookies, for which these persistent cookies are going to be placed on, on users' devices. So these are the rules. Let's have a look at what this looks in practice and what is the audit approach and what we recommend. So in practice, the steps we recommend to follow are, first of all, review and classify the cookies you've got. Have a look at whether they are first or third party cookies, session or, or persistent, the duration, have a chat with your um, IT team or, or people dealing with uh, cookies, whether or not you collect personal data. Think about, am I really using this cookie or this tracking tool? Um, do I need other different ones, additional ones, etc. So once you've got this classification done, then it is very important to group them by purpose. By purpose, I don't, it's not by what they do from a technical point of view, but what you will do with the information you are collecting with them. So there may be 10, 12, 100 cookies used by your organization that I use for exactly the same purpose and they collect more or less similar data and they operate more or less in a similar way. So you may be able to group all of them, all of, all of the, those to explain that all of these ones are for this particular purpose. So when you are explaining this purpose, plan how you will explain this purpose in a very plain language, which is very important. So you know that historically, um, we always had or asked the IT team to, to, for, to fill the form in which each of the cookies is explained and the technical name is provided. And this is still in need to be provided but the first thing the user needs to see needs to be much more clear um, again in plain language to, do, to give you an idea what the ico says in 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 the guidance that was published in july and i quote her she says if you use cookies you will need to make a particular effort to explain the activities in a way that all people will understand so this is kind of translating from IT to plain English, if you like. And this information should be provided granular in a clear way for both the cookies policy and, of course, the consent form. Um, I wanted to bring you an example of consent form um, <clears throat> because the ICO has also, uh, also clarified what, con what constitutes valid consent. Um, on my next slide, you will see that I brought the consent form that is used by the ICO. So it seems that the ICO only uses analytic cookies. So this is simple. Uh, you will see that the explanation provided there is really clear. Um, and on what the ICO says, uh, on the guidance, I would like to flag two points. There will be many points to talk about, uh, but uh, unfortunately, we don't have time to cover each of them. But I think that the, the, the two of them that are um, of which we have more questions by clients is one of them, the consent button. The consent button must be balanced. Um, it must offer an option to consent and an option to reject, um, or this on off option that you can see here on the on from the ICO's example. So um, if you have, for example, a very big 
and centralized or balanced us um, in the center of the of the, the cookies um, notice and accept button that is very big. And then you have a tiny, tiny one reject in a corner. Um, just doing that to the ICO's eyes would be a breach of, of the obligation of collecting um, valid consent compliant with the GDPR requirements, even if you offer the two options. And the second thing is that the ICO states in the guidance that only relying on the user setting by themselves the browsers is not enough at the moment to be considered consent. So you still need to collect consent, even though you provide information about how to set your browser to allow or not allow certain cookies. So this is what I wanted to cover this morning. And now I will hand over to my colleague Alex, who will talk through the marketing amendments and updates. Thank you, Rocio. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Alex Kim, associate in the data privacy team here at Dowling. So with this shift towards online trading that we're seeing, and coupled with the fact that earlier this year, the ICO published a draft version of the code of practice on direct marketing, which I'll refer to as a draft code, we thought it would be useful to our clients to cover this topic for this IP masterclass. So to start this off, uh, direct marketing is governed by two areas of law, data protection and e privacy. For data protection, we have the GDPR and the DPA 2018. Uh, rather helpfully, the DPA actually provides a definition of what direct marketing is, which I've put on a slide. Please note that the GDPR uh, does not provide a definition. For e privacy, we have PECA, which Rossio mentioned earlier in relation to cookies. And PECA, as well as cookies, provides detailed rules in the area of electronic marketing communication, such as email, phone calls, and fax. In the next slides, I would just like to point out that there is an overlap between the two regimes. The most important one being the definition of consent. Whilst PECA was introduced uh, much before GDPR, it has adopted the GDPR definition of consent which is it, consent must be unambiguous and involve a clear affirmative action. So an opt-in as opposed to an opt-out. And moving on, at over 120 pages long, the draft code is certainly not lacking in coverage. It is a consolidation of earlier guidance with important clarifications and updates in areas such as service messages, telefriend schemes, and marketing via social network platforms. I'll go through five subjects from this draft code, which we believe is of most interest to the audience here today. So firstly, service messages. According to the draft code, consent is not required under PECA, where an organization sends service or operational messages to individuals. The draft code provides an example of a mobile network provider, as shown on the slide. A text informing a user that they are approaching their monthly data limit is a service message. However, if that text also encourages customers to buy more data, then the entire message will constitute direct marketing. When determining whether a communication is a service message, key factors include tone, phrasing, and context. Service messages tend to be quite descriptive and neutral in tone, i.e. you're about to reach your data limit. However, organizations will not avoid the direct marketing rules simply by using a neutral tone. For example, a message from a supermarket chain sent to an individual saying, we stock carrots or we stock flour, since flour is in such high demand nowadays, that is clearly promotional. And I'd just like to add that Inserting a link of a special offer in the service message will mean that the entire message is actually going to be direct marketing. Secondly, we come to uh, dual branding promotions, where uh, an organization partners with a third party to deliver electronic communications. Both parties will need to comply with PECA, irrespective of whether it has access to the data used. 
The ICO gives the example of a supermarket sending out a marketing email promoting a specific charity that the supermarket supports. Although the supermarket is not passing the contact details of its customers to the charity, it still needs to ensure that there is appropriate consent from its customers to receive direct marketing promoting the charity. The draft code goes on to say that where possible, it would be good practice for the supermarket to screen against a charity suppression list. We should mention that in practice, there are many variables in relation to dual branding, as all of you may appreciate. The brands could be actively working together to send the direct marketing, or it might just be one party that is entirely driving it without the other party uh, even being aware of it. We can't go through all these variables today, but what we will say is that organizations need to be more cautious of how they approach direct marketing involving other brands. We appreciate that it is a challenge for the internal legal team to review all marketing activities. So the approach, the approach to take might be to share guidelines with the relevant business teams so that they are aware of issues to watch out for and identify materials which should be raised for specific legal review. The next subject is making service conditional on direct marketing. The draft code states that in most cases, it is unlikely that an organization can make the provision of a service or a product be unconditional on an individual providing their consent for direct marketing. The ICO gives the example of a train service whereby it makes a provision of a passenger Wi-Fi conditional on the receipt of consent for direct marketing. The ICO's conclusion is that this would not be compliant. We don't think this is anything too controversial. We had always suspected that this would be the case, but this is the first time that this has been clearly established in the guidance, which uh, is certainly helpful. The fourth subject <coughs> is telefriend schemes. We commonly see organizations asking individuals to share or forward their marketing campaigns, so for example, like a ready-made email, and then share them to family and friends. The ICO describes this as telefriend campaigns. According to the draft code, these schemes are in breach of PECA because it is impossible for the organization to obtain valid consent from the friend because the organization does not have a direct relationship with the friend. Um, this area hasn't been specifically covered by the ICO in the past, so clarification on this is certainly helpful. Um, however, we understand that such schemes are widely used by advertisers and brands. And so we can imagine that the ICO's comments on this area won't um, be particularly welcomed and pushback from marketers can be expected. Whilst organizations won't have to stop such activities immediately, it would be useful to start looking into whether such uh, scheme is being used by your uh, business teams. And lastly, we have uh, social media platforms. I think the ICO's comments on this subject is also likely to cause quite a reaction. Um, in the interest of sticking to the designated time frame for this session, I'll keep it quite brief. Social media platforms offer a service which is commonly referred to as custom audience services. But the explanation on the slides. And the ICO said that it is likely that consent is the appropriate lawful basis for using this service. And they believe that it will be difficult for organizations to rely on the other lawful basis, legitimate interest. However, it's not entirely clear why or how the ICO has come to this conclusion. Under GDPR, organizations can rely on legitimate interest to send direct marketing. And so we are hoping that in the final draft, the ICO will provide more clarity and maybe even more flexibility around this. Um, in the next slide, uh, social media platforms also offer look-alike audience services, again explained on the slide. 
the ICO concluded that the brand and social media platform are joint controllers. As the brand won't have a direct relationship with the individuals in the lookalike audience, they will need to be satisfied that the social media platform has the appropriate transparency information in place. So to bring my section to a close, in conclusion, we recommend that organizations assess their current practices to identify areas of potential non-compliance and get the conversation started. For example, you can review service messages to make sure it doesn't contain marketing messages, or if it does, then uh, check whether there is lawful basis to send that direct marketing message out. Dual branding will have to be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis, so it will help to start reviewing what sorts of partnerships are taking place. And the same applies to social media platform-based advertising. Whilst the final position isn't out from the ICO, it is worth getting the ball rolling in this area. Uh, gather information on how this works within the organization and start sharing um, the direction the regulator could be going towards. And that brings my section to a close. Thank you, everyone. I'll pass the mic to Helen now. Thank you, Alex. So the last topic um, that we'll cover today, uh, why businesses need to be uh, more cyber aware than ever. So over the last decade, um, cybersecurity has become a vital part of corporate culture. While businesses have bolstered their security measures, at the same time, cybercrime has become increasingly sophisticated and the threat from cyber criminals much harder to predict. There are much greater opportunities for cyber criminals and much greater losses that cybercrime can cause. And COVID-19 has, has added to this. In these strange and uncertain times, a significant number of employees will be working at home for the foreseeable future. For some, that will be a new experience. Uh, for others, at least, a significant change in their working pattern. And for many employers and employees, the right infrastructure, the right measures uh, might not be in place, or they are in place, they still might not have been uh, properly tested. Cyber and hacking criminals do not care and are already taking advantage of this. In the UK, the National Cyber Security Centre have detected more UK government branded scams relating to COVID-19 than any other subject. And some more statistics for you uh, on my next slide. Uh, last week, uh, a total of more than two million pounds has been reported by Action Fraud as lost by 862 victims as a as a result of coronavirus related scams. And this has the potential to be just the start because statistics from past recessions show that as GDP and the economy uh, shrink, then reported fraud increases. And research by the University of Portsmouth uh, suggests that if the by the latter part of 2020, if the economy shrinks by 15%, then fraud is expected to increase by 60% in the UK. If the economy shrinks by more, shrunk by, say, 25%, then fraud is expected to increase by 100% in the UK. One of the key threats observed by the NCSC are phishing attacks, which hackers often use as their first route into an organisation. So requests for credentials, for passwords and usernames, or malware, um, might be hidden in emails where individuals are invited to click on links that take them to the web pages run by the cyber criminals. And those cyber criminals are extremely creative in devising new ways to exploit users and technology to achieve their objectives. There is a heightened risk when working from home, away from colleagues and the workplace environment, and perhaps having distractions such as family um, or other family members at home. People may be less vigilant and they may click on a link that they would have thought twice about um, in other circumstances. And the attackers are also playing on human nature and individuals' heightened anxiety in respect of COVID-19. So emails are headed, uh, coronavirus outbreak in your city, there's an emergency, or there might be guidance reporting to come from the World Health Organization or an individual in your area who's a doctor 
which individuals may be more inclined to click on because of their anxiety. Um, and there have also been SMS messages, um, again, phishing scams, um, offering financial incentives for those who may be struggling financially as a consequence of COVID-19. So what should organisations do? And I've got some points here. I mean, the first point is to review cybersecurity measures that you've already got in place and to consider if additional steps should be taken as a consequence of the new working arrangements. Ensure that devices and connections are adequately protected. Warn employees about this increased likelihood of phishing attempts and scams and the possibility of them being related to COVID-19. It's also timely to remind people about your company policies on software updates, passwords, having proper passwords, and also if you do um, allow people to use their own devices and you have a bring your own device policy, make sure um, that they're reminded of it um, and, are, and are complying with it. Make sure that there's a contact that people can um, ask questions and raise concerns given the new issues that people may be experiencing at this time. You should also prepare for some attacks to succeed and ensure that employees know who to contact if that happens, even in circumstances where actually their, their PC may actually be frozen or compromised. They might not be able to get to your resources um, through their normal challenge, so channels. So make sure they know um, who they need to speak to because if an attack does succeed, much better to know about it sooner rather than later. There's a link to the NCSC guidance on the slide as well, which provides more information about the nature of the risks and steps that organisations can take. Now, getting uh, uh, cybersecurity uh, wrong or having cybersecurity failures and, and the effects of cybercrime can, of course, give range to a rise of risks. I've talked about um, fraud uh, and the financial losses there. And of course, um, these, these issues can also give rise to other costs and expenses. It's also a risk of enforcement action from regulators, including fines. And key developments we expect to hear about later in the year are the notification of the fines um, by the ICO in respect of BA and Marriott. So we're looking out for those. Um, other potential consequences, reputational damage, business interruption, and mass claims from affected data subjects. Now in, in relation to the last point, so that's mass claims from affected data subjects, there has at least been some good news for employers and insurers who underwrite their risks in the judgment given by the Supreme Court in the group claim against Morrison's. And as this has been a long awaited judgment, I'm gonna cover this development before we conclude this uh, webinar today. So the, uh, the case of various claimants against Morrison's, this was of course the case involving Morrison's work employee, Mr. Skelton, in November, 2013. He was tasked with transmitting payroll data for the entire workforce to Morrison's internal auditors, a task he had been asked to undertake and had done the, the previous year. He also did this in 2013, but at the same time, he kept a copy of that information for himself, publishing it on the internet, intent to pursue his own vendetta and to do Morrison's damage. And a group of the affected individuals brought claims against Morrison's for breach of section 44 of the Data Protection Act 1998, misuse of private information and breach of confidence. Now the High Court delivered its judgment um, some time ago, back in December 2017. It rejected the contention that Morrison bore any primary liability to the employees. It came to the view that Morrison had taken appropriate technical and organisational measures to protect the data in question, save in one respect, which was actually not causative of any damage caused. The trial judge did, however, find that Morrison's was vicariously liable as Mr. Skelton's employer for Mr. Skelton's actions. Now, Morrison's had argued it couldn't be vicariously liable because what Mr. Skelton had done, it wasn't committed during the course of his employment, um, but this was rejected by the court on the basis that what he did was still closely related to what he was asked to do, transmit the data to the auditors, even if 
the task of then publishing that on the internet was not authorised. Now the court hadn't um, considered in that, in that trial um, what the claims were worth as the trials of liability and quantum had been split. But this finding of vicarious liability against Morrison's had the potential to be very expensive for Morrison's as even if each claimant only received a very small sum of money, when multiplied by the number of claimants, then the total bill would be a very significant sum. So Morrison's appealed on two issues. They appealed that they maintain their argument that there should be no vicarious liability on the facts. And alternatively, they also argued that regardless that the DPA 1998 excludes vicarious liability, in essence, that the DPA 1998 exclusively set out the scope of Morrison's liabilities as a statute. And as it doesn't mention vicarious liability, then that should be, that should be excluded. Uh, the Court of Appeal dismissed the appeal in October 28, in particular noting that the motive of the rogue employee was irrelevant. And they also felt that the finding by previous finding by the High Court created no doomsday scenario for other employers as they could obtain insurance to cover any claims that they might subsequently receive. Morrison's pursued the matter to the Supreme Court who delivered its judgment at the start of the month. On the question of whether Morrison's was vicariously liable, so the first question, the court said there were two questions that had to be addressed. What functions or field of activities had been entrusted to the individual and was there sufficient connection um, with the wrongful conduct? Now, the Supreme Court said that actually the Court of Appeal had misunderstood the previous authorities and in fact it was material whether Mr Skelton was acting on Morrison's business or for purely personal reasons. As Mr Skelton was, as the court put it, on a frolic of his own, Morrison's was not vicariously liable. So this was good news um, for Morrison's, but on different facts, the decision could have been different. Now, having decided there was no vicarious liability, the court didn't need to look at the second question, uh, whether the Data Protection Act 1998 excluded vicarious liability, because they'd already found there wasn't, wasn't any. Um, but the court considered it would be helpful to do so. And that apparent of the appeal actually failed. The court finding that imposing a statutory duty is not inconsistent with the coexistence of vicarious liability. So what that means going forward for organisations, as summarised on the next slide, is that that means that employers can still be liable for data protection breaches where the employee is engaged, however misguidedly, in furthering their own employer's business and organisations may also be directly liable if they fail to comply with security requirements to safeguard data. Now this was a Data Protection Act 1998 case, but it will be, um, we expect, mirrored under GDPR decisions going forward because of the similarity of regi regimes, save that if anything, um, obviously the, uh, the requirements on data controllers are even more stringent um, under the GDPR. So the outcome is unlikely to change the growing trend in group claims and other claims against data controllers arising out of personal data breaches. Cybersecurity is more important than ever, and it's important to be extra vigilant as we are all experiencing the impact of COVID-19. So that concludes what I wanted to say on cybersecurity. We've got um, five or so minutes, which I think will enable us to cover some questions. Rossi, I think there were uh, a couple of questions that came in for you, possibly sh shortish questions. So do you want to take those and then we'll hand over to Alex? Yeah, I think there are four questions I'd like to, to answer. Um, so the first one is, what do you mean by consent? form within the accountability, uh, accountability window. Can you exp expand on this, please? So um, what you mean is that anything that you put on your website or on, on the app uh, is accountable. So it's a window to how accountable you are. Consent form, I mean any consent form that you use 
uh, in order to, for users to, to give you consent. That, could, that may be for a cookie, that may be to process personal data, and this is what I mean, that um, when a regulator is investigating, they may even register as a an user and, and look at how you collect consent, um, and they may investigate that before even they contact you. So, so then if you change it later, they will know. So that, that's what I mean, that, that's what I meant by consent form, is any consent form that you use. Uh, there's another one, um, I think I responded to that, but uh, I read it through anyway. On cookies, we have seen a trend where the developers highlight the yes option for cookies were uh, more prominently than options for opting out um, when presenting the cookies pop up and they ask, if this practice is permitted under the current UK and new laws. Um, and we, our view is that this is not a valid option. It needs to be balanced um, as it was um, shown on the slide. Um, you can also, for example, to see another example, the European Data Protection Board's website, now it has an accept and reject, and they are exactly the same size, um, and this is what's expected to be. Um, another question is, what are the penalties for getting this wrong? Okay, so um, in terms of a failure to provide the information or the way the information is provided in the terms and conditions, that is subject to different regulations, sector-specific regulations, so it depends on the case, but under the consumer controls regulation, which is what um, we were talking here, then the main consequence will be more in terms of that some of these terms that were not clear will not apply or will apply for the benefit of the consumer. In terms of liability, you may not be able to claim for certain li li liabilities. Or, for example, if there are changes on the delivery times or methods, um, and if they were not informed, then um, you will consider that it is what it was before or again on the benefit of the customer. And this may affect, for example, on your costs. So if you pretend that now the, uh, the customer um, will have to, to, to pay, for example, if they want to cancel uh, a purchase and they want to, to give it back and to return it, and that is not clear, then you, you may not be able to claim for those costs. Uh, but in terms of the cookies, I think that's a very good question, actually, because my view is that if you are not collecting personal data, um, what the Privacy and Electronic Communication Regulation states is that the penalty is it will be up to five hundred thousand pounds because this is a regulation that comes from a directive that is it was approved before GDPR. We are waiting for the for one which will be um, in which is supposed that the that the fines will be more similar than GDPR. But at the moment, this is what we've got. And even though you need to, um, you will need to to interpret the the meaning of consent and the GDPR, um, the penalty for breaching PERC will be up to five hundred thousand pounds. However, having said that, if you are collecting personal data through cookies, then you are processing personal data, and then GDPR applies. If the legal basis to process that personal data. Um, is consent, uh, even if it is according to PERC, but it is now, now we are in the scope of processing personal data, then uh, you are facing the GDPR fines, um, which, as you may know, is up to 400, sorry, for, uh, up to 4% of the total global annual turnover, um, or uh, up to 20 million euros. And then the last one, that's very quick, but um, I thought it's interesting to clarify this. Um, I read that the ICO will not take action against companies during lockdown. What is the risk if we do not update the privacy notice or consent form? So uh, the ICO has said that it's going to relax or understand the circumstances in which uh, the circumstances we, are, we all of us are facing in terms of security. So they understand that now we are moving on to remote working, you know, and and it may take a time to catch up with the security requirements. Uh, it, it, it has expressly said that it will understand if you can justify it, not by default, that's the key, um, any delays, for example, in responding to subject access requests 
for freedom of information requests, and so on. But it has not said that it will not enforce, and in fact, it has expressly said that if a company try to get any advantage of this situation, actually will enforce very hardly. That's, I think, yeah, the questions are about. So I'll hand over to Alex to respond to this. Yeah. yeah, conscious of time. I'm conscious of time, Alex. So do you want to take one um, direct Martin question and then we'll conclude the session and we can always take additional questions um, and follow up by email afterwards? Yes, yes, definitely. So um, the question we got was, is consent required for communications regarding recruitment and job vacancy purposes to prospective, um, to prospective candidates because it constitutes direct marketing? Well, the quick answer is uh, no, assuming that the communication is uh, strictly on job recruitment and doesn't include other messages. Um, since job recruitment is for internal admin resourcing purposes, it's unlikely to be considered promoting your own products or services. So rules around how you send out such communication will be covered by the data protection laws. Okay, that's it for me. Thank you. Many thanks to everyone for joining us. As I said at the outset, we will follow up with a copy of, of the session. And if you've got any additional questions, uh, then do feel free to contact one of us after the session. Many thanks. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you.